You're listening to Bible Prophecy Daily, a weekday podcast where Bible prophecy matters and matters greatly. Hello, I'm Holly Pivik. Welcome to this episode. I'm going to talk with you today about a popular and fast-growing movement among Christians known as the New Apostolic Reformation, also known as the NAR, or NAR for short. This movement has millions of participants in the United States and throughout the world. One of the most well-known NAR churches today is Bethel Church in Redding, California, home to Bethel Music. Other NAR churches and organizations in the United States that you may have heard of include the International House of Prayer in Kansas City, Missouri, led by Mike Bickle, and Jesus Culture in Sacramento, California, led by Banny Leapshire, and the NAR leaders Lou Engel, Heidi Baker, Cindy Jacobs, Rick Joyner, Mark Schrona, Cheon, and Randy Clark, to name a few. NAR leaders emphasize miraculous signs and wonders and teach that God is giving new revelation through an end-time movement of new apostles and prophets who will equip the church with supernatural powers to transform society, take dominion, and prepare the way for God's kingdom to be set up on earth in Christ's return. Churches must submit to the authority of NAR apostles and prophets so they can bring new revelation Christians allegedly require for developing miraculous powers, such as prophesying, healing the sick, raising the dead, and working even greater miracles than Jesus worked. The apostles' followers will also wage high-level spiritual warfare against demonic territorial spirits that allegedly rule over cities, nations, and societal institutions. So if you follow these apostles and prophets, you'll be privy to God's special favor and become a player in his end-time plans and purposes for the world. But those who refuse to submit to their leadership will sit on the sidelines as mere spectators. And those who dare to speak critically about our apostles and prophets are seen by some to be under the influence of a powerful demon known as the spirit of religion. A lot of destruction has been caused by NAR's controversial teachings about the end time, miracles, healing, spiritual warfare, prayer, new revelation, and the alleged authority of today's apostles and prophets. Their dominionist aspirations, false promises of healing, and failed prophecies, including predictions that Donald Trump would win a second term in office in the 2020 U.S. presidential election, have damaged the reputation of the church and made it more difficult for believers to share the gospel going forward. I've received countless letters from people around the world sharing the ways they and their loved ones have experienced harm from the NAR movement, spiritual abuse, split families and split churches, and worst of all, disillusionment with Christianity and the loss of their faith. But sadly, these teachings and practices have infiltrated many churches, which is why I'm hosting this podcast, to warn people about NAR by explaining the harmful teachings and practices and showing that they do not withstand biblical or logical scrutiny. I've written four books about the NAR movement with a co-author, Doug Guyvett, Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at Biola University and Talbot School of Theology. These books include our latest recently released Counterfeit Kingdom, The Dangers of New Revelation, New Prophets, and New Age Practices in the Church, published by B&H. We're grateful that this book is one of the bestsellers in Christian apologetics. So what specifically does NAR teach? That's the question I'll answer in this episode. The core belief, the thing that sets NAR apart from all other Christian groups, is this. The belief that apostles and prophets must govern churches. In other words, apostles and prophets must hold formal positions in church governance, directing the church in an authoritative way, somewhat like a pastor or elder. But a NAR apostle or prophet has much greater authority than a pastor or an elder. For one thing, The pastors and elders of a church must submit to the apostles and prophets and receive their revelation. Also, apostles and prophets typically govern multiple churches, all the churches in their network, not just the single congregation. And as I plan to show in future episodes, our apostles claim their authority extends beyond churches to societal institutions. It extends even to angels who must fulfill their prayer declarations. The belief that apostles and prophets govern separates NAR from even classical Pentecostals and historic charismatics. Thus, my critique of NAR is not a critique of Pentecostal or charismatic teachings about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
To be sure, Pentecostals and Charismatics, like NAR leaders, emphasize the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit, such as speaking in tongues, prophesying, and healing. They believe that prophecy is a gift to be exercised for the edification of the church, and that an apostle is a gifted missionary or church planner. But in general, Pentecostals and Charismatics have not believed that, in addition to the continuation of miraculous gifts, contemporary apostles and prophets must govern the church. This explains why even many Pentecostals, Charismatics, and other continuationists are concerned about NAR and agree with the argumentation against NAR in the books Doug and I have written. The idea that apostles and prophets must hold formal offices in the church's government is a NAR novelty from which many other extreme NAR teachings and practices flow. Indeed, the late C. Peter Wagner, the apostle who coined the term New Apostolic Reformation, called the belief that apostles hold offices in church government the most radical of all the changes being brought in by the New Apostolic Reformation. In his book titled Changing Church, he writes, The name I have chosen for this movement is the New Apostolic Reformation. I use Reformation because, as I have said, I believe it at least matches the Protestant Reformation in its overall impact. Apostolic, because the most radical of all the changes is the widespread recognition of the gift and, apo- gift and office of apostle in today's churches. Wagner explains that prior to the NAR movement, the church at large was left, quote, with a period of 1,800 years when the biblical government of the church was not explicitly in its proper place, unquote. The current restoration of the apostles and prophets to church government is pivotal, according to Wagner, because the new revelation churches require can only be received by apostles and prophets. In his book, Apostles Today, he writes, whereas every believer can and should hear directly from the Holy Spirit, It is only the apostles in proper relation to prophets who hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So NAR is a restorationist movement because its leaders teach that God intended for the church to always be led by authoritative apostles and prophets in each successive generation, but that they have been missing from church government for centuries. Well, maybe not entirely missing. Certain apostles have been around through the centuries, NAR leaders will say. But those apostles and prophets weren't recognized as such. But NARA leaders claim that in recent decades, God has begun restoring them to their rightful roles and proper recognition. Teachings about the office of apostle initially started to gain momentum in the United States with the latter rain movement of the late 1940s. Yet, though those teachings were, at that time, rejected by the Assemblies of God, the largest Pentecostal denomination, and those teachings fizzled out, they later resurfaced in the 1980s and 1990s when the offices of prophet and apostle began to be recognized in a growing number of independent charismatic churches. In fact, so many churches began to recognize the office of apostle by the year 2001 that Wagner labeled that year the beginning of the second apostolic age. The key scripture used by Wagner and other NAR leaders to support their teaching that apostles and prophets must govern churches, is Ephesians 4.11. In the ESV, this verse reads, And he, referring to Christ, give the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. From this single verse, they've developed a NAR doctrine called fivefold ministry and built their entire movement upon it. According to this doctrine, Christ, at his ascension into heaven, gave five offices for governing the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, also referred to as shepherds, and teachers. But Ephesians 4.11 does not support the NAR doctrine of fivefold ministry. It merely lists five types of gifted leaders Christ has given the church. It does not teach that he has given the church a hierarchical leadership structure made up of five formal governing offices. It doesn't say anything at all about offices. Despite the lack of biblical support for their fivefold ministry teaching, NAR leaders have taken it even further. They teach not only that the church government must include apostles and prophets, they teach that apostles and prophets hold the highest offices. To use the words of Bethel senior leader Danny Silk, when it comes to the church government, apostles and prophets are first and second in God's, quote, order of priority, unquote. To support this teaching, they turn to two verses, Ephesians 2.20 and 1 Corinthians 12.28. Ephesians 2.20 states that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, 
with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. And 1 Corinthians 12, 28 states, And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. But these verses are quoted out of their context. Ephesians 2.20 refers back to the beginnings of the church. It does not teach that God intended a new batch of apostles and prophets to provide top-level leadership for the church in each generation. It teaches that a foundation has already been laid, not that each generation is to relay that foundation. Indeed, in Scripture, there is found no attempt to replace the 12 apostles after their deaths. Scripture doesn't provide any instruction for the appointment of future apostles to govern the church. And 1 Corinthians 12, 28 provides a list of spiritual gifts, not church offices. That is clear in the larger context of the 12th chapter, where the entire focus is on spiritual gifts. These verses simply do not teach that apostles and prophets hold the two highest church offices. Yet NARA leaders insist that churches that desire to operate as Christ intended, including having access to full supernatural power, must have a government that includes all five offices and especially the apostles and prophets. For example, the prophet Chris Belton at Bethel Church claims God spoke to him about the unprecedented miraculous power that will be released through the global church because of the fivefold ministry. He writes, When the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher flow together and create a healthy governmental covering over the saints, this covering forms a kind of celestial vortex that creates strategic alliances with our heavenly allies. The implication of the word was that the Lord was establishing the fivefold ministry in his church and that the outcome would be increased angelic activity manifested by extraordinary miracles rarely witnessed in the history of the planet. You can find those words in Valton's book, Heavy Rain. You can also find these words where Valton claims that Jesus spoke to him directly about the new revelation God is about to give to the global church through apostleships or churches led by apostles. The Lord also told me, I'm about to open up the vaults of heaven and reveal depths of my glory that have never before been seen or understood by any living creature. Wrapping up, NARA leaders teach that apostles, working together with prophets, must govern the church. The reason they must govern is so they can bring critical new revelation the church at large requires to bring God's kingdom to earth. There are many new revelations coming from different apostles and prophets, but the revelations all boil down to one thing. They are strategies equipping the global church to rise up as an end-time army of miracle-working Christians. As NAR has become better known and concerns about it more widespread, this movement's apostles and prophets have responded to their critics, including myself, with fallacious arguments. For example, one common response is that their critics are all just cessationists who do not believe that God still performs miracles through spiritually gifted believers like he did in the first century. But this response is a distraction tactic. As I've already said, many Pentecostals, Charismatics, and other continuationists who aren't cessationists are also very concerned about the teachings of today's apostles and prophets, including their teachings that apostles and prophets must govern churches and that they give new critical revelations. Besides, NAR leaders have falsely portrayed cessationists as denying the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. Another response you will likely hear is that the apostles and prophets do not really claim to have extraordinary authority, and they certainly don't believe their words have the same authority as Scripture. But you must not only listen to what NAR leaders say, but also scrutinize what they do. They may say their prophetic words should never be treated like Scripture, but this does not cancel their expectation that you take their words very seriously. And many NAR leaders have given revelations they claim apply to the global church. Many of today's apostles and prophets also object to critics' use of the NAR label. They will either say that the NAR movement does not exist or that critics have exaggerated its size and dangers. They point out that many people who are identified as being part of the New Apostolic Reformation have never even heard that term, and don't think they are part of any movement, so they will say that we and other critics should stop using the term NAR, or if they do acknowledge the existence of NAR. To all that we say, it's certainly true that many people in our churches have never heard the term New Apostolic Reformation, but just because others have not heard the term NAR does not mean they are not part of the movement. 
What matters is if they hold to the movements, beliefs, and practices. And just because some apostles and prophets deny they are part of NAR does not mean they are not NAR. Though I must point out that many leaders have embraced the NAR label. Again, if they believe that apostles and prophets must govern churches, then they are NAR, whether they know it or care to admit it. As far as the claim that critics have exaggerated the size and dangers of NAR, we encourage people to look at the evidence, such as what we have carefully documented in our books, citing the writings and teachings of the NAR leaders themselves. Because of these and other tactics by NAR leaders to downplay the influence or even existence of this movement and their denials to have anything to do with it, you can't always tell right away that this or that church is governed by NAR leadership. You have to be discerning and know what to listen for. But we've discovered that people who know little about the movement soon learn that they've had a closer encounter with it than they realized. If you want to dig deeper on what I've talked about today, be sure to check out our book, Counterfeit Kingdom, which is available to buy at Amazon or anywhere else uh, books are sold. Thanks for listening. I look forward to talking with you again soon. In the meantime, you can follow me at hollypivic.com. That's H-O-L-L-Y. P-I-V-E-C. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks for listening to Bible Prophecy Daily. We hope you learned something valuable today. Be sure to subscribe wherever you heard this podcast so you never miss an episode. 